All right, 99.9 Punk World Radio FM. We have a great interview coming your way, and we are joined by Canadian punk rock legend. That's right. We have Thomas Thacker of not only just Gub, but also Sum 41 as well. How are you doing this evening, Tom? Doing good. Thank you for the kind word. I don't know about a legend, but I play punk rock, you know. I've done it for a couple decades. I'm doing good. I'm in New Orleans, and it's a million degrees outside, and beautiful city of New Orleans, sweating my ass off. And I believe you're currently in the middle of a tour with not only, of course, Sum 41, but The Offspring and Simple Plan as well, going all across the States. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, we have, we're about two weeks in. We have about three weeks left over. It's been fantastic shows. We're buds with both bands, um, and the shows have been killer. And we, I mean, the, the heat has been killer as well, but, uh, but they're just awesome shows. Super fun. I remember when that tour got announced, actually. I was, I was super jealous of the Americans. I was like, man, like, seriously, three amazing bands all together for such, such amazing ticket prices as well, man. I saw tickets for, like, 30 to 40 bucks, and I'm like, what? Like, that's insane. Yeah, I heard about that. I didn't even actually look up the ticket prices, but I, I heard that they were reasonable. That's cool. I mean, you know, we want people to come to the shows and not to break their bank. So, here we are. But also, Tom, I know you're a, bu a busy individual, and of course, this is actually your off day on tour, so I don't want to take you away too long, but i got to bring you back to the early 90s, where you actually formed Gub alongside Theo, Wolfman Pat, and Kelly McCulley. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us the story behind Gub, and of course, what actually made you four individuals decide to come together to, to start this monumental band? So Theo and I were friends. We'd been friends for years, and uh, we kind of played in some things together. Uh, we had just kind of played in a band, and it dissolved. I feel like people uh, had different thing, directions they wanted to go creatively. And Theo and I, you know, we left that thinking, let's do something fun and like punk rock. It doesn't have to be like traditional punk rock. We weren't totally sure. But catchy songs and just fun and not taking ourselves seriously. Because it seemed in Vancouver at the time, everyone in music was like taking themselves way too seriously. Um, I was working at a music star at the time. I was working at AMB Sound. And that kind of blew, like it wasn't like an indie store, but it had everything. And so I got records of all kinds. And it kind of like blew the walls down and we were listening to everything and you know we, we we knew we wanted to do a punk rock band but we also um you know we liked heavy music like metallica and we also liked a lot of lo-fi sort of indie rock we loved like hearing the hiss of the tape and, and the audible punches and things um and uh then I saw a band in Vancouver called Spark Marker. I saw them in, uh, it's like 93 maybe. And they were playing a little venue called the Nappy Dugout. And I was, they blew me away. Like it was the best band that I'd ever seen, like an independent band in Vancouver. It was like, these guys are as good as any big band out there. The Bad Religions or the Green Days of the Nirvanas or whatever we kind of liked. They were huge bands. Um, and then I read a story that uh, him from Spark Marker had written in Discord Magazine, the Vancouver, like CITR college publication, for those who don't know, college music uh, radio publication. Uh, and he, he had written this thing about how they had gone to New York as an independent band. They went to New York and he, his comment was something along the lines of, we came to conquer New York and New York conquered us. And this is a band that I thought was the best band I've ever seen. I'm like, I want to be like that. We, it doesn't matter what the fuck stands in our way. We are going to do this. And that's what we did. We we're like, okay, we need to put a band together. We had a few songs. We recorded them. Kelly worked at the record store that I worked in. And she, uh, I played it over the, in the store in the morning when there weren't many people in there that we could do that. And so I played it for my friends that worked there. She heard it, and she was a bass player. She said, I, this is awesome. I'm, I want to do this. And then the hardest part was finding a drummer. <clears throat> we, we put an ad in the Georgia Strait, the local music publication, 
the, the sort of wide, like it covers Vancouver and the Fraser Valley and everything. And it, it was just nonstop, like people that didn't really get what we wanted to do. I can't remember what uh, uh, influences that we put. It might've been the Ramones, Husker Du. Uh, I'm, I can't even remember, but uh and people would call us up and be like, I like Nazareth. And we're like, yeah, me too, but that's not what we're doing here. And they're like, I can play punk. And we're like, I, I don't think you can. And so we had all these <laughs> many auditions and it just wasn't working. And so I would play drums on the demos and we would record our songs. And eventually uh, Wolfman Pack uh, called and he was like, I, I like Husker Du. I like, I mean, I can't even remember which bands he made, but it was like, classic punk rock bands and we found our guy and he was crazy he was like a, a total character he was into like taking the piss out of everything like we were um and he had been in punk rock bands since 1981 um so he he like rounded it out and, and like legitimized our band kind of in a way he didn't look like a punk rocker he looked like a lumberjack you know he was like, and he was crazy like he beat us up repeatedly you know like it was a consistent thing we would get that was his punk rock it was like the 80s craziness but that rounded out the band i hadn't so he called me on my birthday in 1994 and said hey i jammed with the guy with, with theo and kelly and i, I love it let's do this and like, yeah awesome and he said happy birthday of course but uh, yeah it was on my birthday and that was the first time i spoke to him and then we you know we met with him and then the rest is History. I mean, there's a lot of history. And also as well, in the year 95, you guys actually released one of my favorite uh, just the you know, mini releases that you guys did, which was actually a four-track, seven-inch uh, EP titled Green Beans and Almonds. Looking back on that phenomenal release, I was wondering if you can actually just tell us the story behind that project. And of course, do you guys have any plans to actually re remaster it and maybe actually put it on online streaming services? Yeah, so after, you know, once we got the lineup together, we made uh, uh, the Gob self-titled EP. It's out of print, but is actually coming out very soon. Like in October, it's coming out on, on uh, Dynalone Records. And for the first time on vinyl, we had done it on, uh, on a CD. And all of the records are actually coming out, but we can talk more about that later. But so we had made the EP, um, personnel changed, we had a new bass player. We were recording, like, songs were, we had so many song ideas and, like, coming up with songs all the time. We just started recording them and, like, figuring out what to do with them. We wanted to put something out. We were booking shows and doing a lot of shows, and we needed something, like, any sort of piece of music. But, you know, I was always into like cutting the fat like we had 30 songs and we decided to put nine of them on the ep like these are this is the most cohesive of the, like group of the songs let's do this and then seven inches kind of fit that um so the first seven inch we did was one called dildozer and we had recorded a whole bunch of songs it's like half the songs that are on too late with friends um and then we went into the studio to do some more. We had some more songs. We did the, so we had met a couple, like a friend of mine that worked at AMB Sound as well, uh, decided he wanted to kind of help us out. And he had a record label called Land Speed Records. And so we were going to put out, we had done the Dildozer 7-inch. Now we're, we had plans for this new one. And we had a bunch of songs. And we went in and we did them and I swear we recorded them in a day and mixed them in a day. Like we were never really happy with the mix of those because the guitars are at different levels and stuff. And we just banged them out like super quick um, with fun fact, the, the guy, the, other, the, the partner in Land Speed Records that actually engineered that is Dave Holmes, who be, became Coldplay's manager. So he's this music bigwig now, but he was our buddy who put out our record back then and actually engineered that uh, Green Beans and Almonds 7-inch. So, And I absolutely love just the... I absolutely love just the cover of that as well, you know, with the, with the green giant. It literally looks almost like that label of a can of beans. <laughs> it's, I think it is. The, like, I don't know how, how much it was changed. But, I mean, all of that happened so fast. I remember we had two songs and we decided 
like we took ourselves like we didn't take ourselves we wanted to do stupid shit that amused us all the time and that's and we so we had those four songs and we said we didn't have titles from so we're like this one's gonna be i want you back baby and this one's gonna be i don't want you back baby like we just did silly stuff like that to amuse ourselves really fun but like a you know we weren't taking it very seriously and uh anyway that so we we made a couple seven inches and you know we just we're releasing all our old records on vinyl and i was talking to dine alone about incorporating all this other stuff but there is just so much right now that we may get back to that and do seven inches or do these b-sides with uh special like anthology releases or something but we'll see but yes that will see the light of day eventually those songs will come out and also as well october 10th of 2000 you guys actually released your third studio album titled the world according to gub i was wondering if you can actually just tell us the story behind this monumental album and of course what ultimately inspired you guys to name the album after a novel uh by john irving we were pretty, uh, we were a very busy band by that time. And we had found, like, we found our lineup that was really working. Like, Gabe became our drummer, and Craig was our bass player. We were on the road all the time. We had signed with network management. We had kind of, our friend from Landspeed worked at network, and he brought us over to network management. We, they didn't have any punk rock bands at the time, they were very mainstream. Um, so I think it was always sort of like they saw that we were playing decent sized shows and we were selling some records. So they, you know, they kind of jumped on board um, and they started to try to break us into the mainstream with the what to do video on how far shall it takes you. Um, and trying to, you know, get us played on radio and, and video they submitted us for all of that stuff. Uh, by the time we were doing World According To, we were, we were on such a roll that I, I remember being in, this, in the studio and we would deliver a song every day and network was, their minds were blown. Like every single song, they were more stoked than the, the previous. And then we went in and did I Hear You Calling one day and they were just like, okay, this is it. Let's do this record. And things were in motion, we're like, well, we got more songs. They're like, well, let's do the record. But, you know, you've got tour dates coming up and things are moving so fast that we didn't have a title. Like, we we had no idea what we wanted to call that record. And we were kind of, you know, we were coming up with new musical sounds and stuff. And the band was, the sound was changing. And we had, at that time, we had actually leaked to Exclaim or someone that we were, as a joke, that we were going to call our our album love and relationship and it got such backlash like there were so many people in vancouver that were so bummed about it and to me it was like a funny thing for a punk rock band to have an album called love and relationships when i mean it kind of was but i don't know i guess that's cheesy but i don't know we you know we weren't thinking about it that much i'm not sure who came up with the uh, world according to god like it might have it was either me or fia but we loved maybe we had watched the movie the world according to garp in the studio or something and we were like that's it's going to be the world according to god and so that's where the title came from we hadn't read the book we had seen the film and also as well before we move off the topic of this amazing album one of your guys' most well-known songs i know you mentioned a few moments ago i hear you calling uh, i was wondering if you can talk about the music video for a few minutes where i actually remember that it was nominated for best music video at the 2002 juno's I was wondering if you could actually just tell us a story behind this music video. And of course, who was the woman that actually played the hostage in that music video? Because I always thought she looked like Tori Wilson, the, the female WWE wrestler. But I, I, I would never could find exactly who she was on the internet. Huh. You know what? I, I don't even... I, I don't remember who it was. Like, I'm, I'm sure there's some sort of casting... Uh, like some sort of record of the casting somewhere. I have the original treatment that Josh Levy wrote. And, you know, when we, we they submitted to a bunch of people and instantly when we saw the zombies and the soccer, we were like, we're definitely doing the zombies. 
I think we were kind of getting tired of the sports videos. It's, it seems like sports kind of became a central thing in our videos. The first, I mean, there's lake jumping and soda, and then you're too cool. We decided to do all the winter sports of Canada in it just because we're a Canadian band. And when we were meeting American bands, they, they just always, everything was about Canada. Canada, as they would sometimes call it. And, um, so that was just sort of a joke. But then we did this one, and it's like, it's all about the zombies. So the soccer was fine. Um, and it gives us a reason to kind of pit us against the zombies. Um, but yeah, we, we love Josh's idea. And it was just, just an awesome video. It's funny. I went to a, a birthday in New York City. I live in New York now. Um, but I went with a friend. Who, I didn't even know the person whose birthday. It was his friend's birthday. He was like, let's go get drinks and, and have fun at the birthday. And when we're at this birthday party, the person sitting next to me, and you know, I've, a lot of people in the United States don't necessarily know who God is unless they know punk rock. But I'm sitting next to this woman who asks, like, what band I play in? And I said, God. And she's like, oh, my God. She was the choreographer of the zombies in the I Hear You Calling video. We just happened to go to this party. And she lives in New York doing choreography for, I don't know, theater or something. But wild that we like ran into each other at a dinner party. And I gotta say that video is so fun to actually watch. I mean, it's over twenty years old. I still go back and watch it. I remember when it debuted on uh, Much Music back in the day, and it was playing on uh, I believe it's called YTV's The Hit List. All those amazing uh, video music programs, and I still go back on YouTube and watch it just to kind of relive the old good old days. Yeah, for sure. We got a lot of love from uh, Much Music. From day one, like we made the soda video thinking no one would ever play that ever. Like we thought it was the funniest thing when we were going to jump bikes into a lake. Like not realizing that we were making the coolest video that anyone's ever seen at that point. And it's also a minute long, so they just played it everywhere. But yeah, we had, they played the shit out of our videos. And we became good friends with a lot of people there, Cynthia and Lee and uh, George Stromboulopoulos. And it was awesome people working there in those days. But as you know, you should ask the, the wrestler that you named if she is the person. She could be. Like, like I have no idea. Maybe she'll see this and come out of the woodwork. That's, one, that's one thing I've always. That's one thing I've always wondered, Tom. Like I, I even tried looking it up myself because sometimes the internet has the answers nowhere. Not even Reddit forums. But I always said I looked at my wife. I was like, this woman looks like Tori Wilson, and I'm like, do you know who who it is? And she's like, if you don't know, you own a punk rock radio station, been a fan of Gob for over 20 years. If you don't know, how the hell am I gonna know? And I'm like, fair enough. <laughs> well, maybe she'll comment on the YouTube now if, if she sees this, or maybe we should post post a question on the YouTube, like, who are you? But also as well, in 2003, speaking of much music and whatnot, you guys actually portrayed yourselves in the Canadian comedy film Going the Distance, where you guys actually, of course, portrayed yourselves uh, performing at the uh, Much Music Video Awards. I was wondering, from what you guys can, sorry, from what you can recall, how did you guys actually land that opportunity in the movie? And of course, what was it like just being a part of the set? Um, I mean, we were kind of, at that point, we were sort of mainstays in Canadian music. You know, we had kind of gotten to that level where we were at much music and on radio. So I think when, I can't remember how many artists were in that film. I know we, we were in a scene with Avril Lavigne. Um, but it was, you know, it was a much music movie. And they had, they had funded and produced this, this film going the distance. So it, it kind of revolved around much music and artists that, were known at much music. Um, I, yeah, I can't, I don't remember who asked us to be in it. Like it's just a thing that happens. Yeah. But uh, it, yeah, it was, it was a fun experience. You know, I think Theo kind of rewrote his part with the banana and stuff. And I mean, to me, it's great. Like Theo's always got, yeah, everything he does is hilarious and crazy, hilarious or crazy. And yeah, he suggests something like, yeah, I can't deep throw this bitch or whatever. <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, they loved it. I think they edited out of it now, though. It's, it's a little much. Yeah, I had the VHS copy back in the day, and it had all that in it with the banana and everything. And then when I found, I think I found a DVD copy, like there was a re release, and they actually didn't have that. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to break out the VHS player. <laughs> 
my son's five and he knows that I've been in that film. He's like, he wants to watch it so bad. Oh, yeah. well, one day. One day when he gets a little bit older. It's, it's, uh, it's, I, I'm not going to lie. I watched it when I was young just because of the fact was I didn't really have like the, that parent parenting in my life. But I would definitely suggest that's a movie when you're at least 16. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like there was an easier way around it then. But I guess there is now as well. Like, I mean, you can watch anything online, really, if you turn the parental, uh, the parental guidance off of it or whatever. Yeah, it's much easier nowadays. I mean, back in the day, you used to have to, like, steal the remote and guess the four to, I think, four to six-digit pin code on the cable box. And if you get wrong three times, it will lock for an hour. So then you got to go back yeah. and do it an hour later. And hopefully you get it right. Well, I mean, back in the day, it was like... A your friend stole the porno out of his parents' cabinet or whatever, you know? It was easy in a sense, too. But also as well, aside from Gobfa for a few moments, on May 11th of 2006, you were actually recruited as some 41 uh, touring guitarist, where just a few years later in 2009, you actually became an official member of the band. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a story behind that entire ordeal. And of course, what ultimately actually made Derek decide to bring you into the band full time? Um, I mean, we had been friends with Sum 41 for years. They, we heard about them um, through their manager at the time, who was in Chebel Charger. And he, uh, eventually they got on some shows and they opened for Gob for a few shows in Ontario. And then it seemed like out of nowhere, they got signed and they blew up. And so then they brought us on tour and we became friends. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I hadn't really thought about, uh, I, like I knew that Dave had left the band and they, they were like going on as a three piece or whatever. But it, like when I, I didn't even think about it. I, I think I had spoken to Dave, but I hadn't spoken to anyone else. And then Derek emailed me out of the blue and just like, would you be interested in, in uh, playing with us? Uh, and they were going through these auditions. So they had a bunch of people in Los Angeles coming and visiting. So I went out and played with them. And I think, I mean, it totally made sense for me to play with them or for them to like once we went and played together, we played the same stuff. Like Derek knew that I could play some of the metal stuff and he like had confidence that we could pull off the, the things that they had done. And uh, I think it was hard for them to find someone, an outsider. They knew him. Me, so, so I started playing with them. Um, it wasn't long, like before, it, like it just, it felt good from the beginning. Like, uh, we knew each other. We were already friends and we played together and we, you know, we loved each other's music. So it really felt like I was in the band almost from the get go. We were buds. So um, I wasn't, I mean, I, it, it wasn't really surprising when they asked me to, to be, to play, to be in the band because we had, I don't know, we had bonded so much over the, like somebody was always working, you know, we were always together all the time. And so you kind of, it's either going to work or it's not going to work. And it worked. So here I am. I'm still here. <laughs> and also as well, on May 19th of 2011, you were actually a part of Sum 41's fifth studio album. Even though Derek actually recorded all the guitar parts, you actually helped co-write the very first single, uh, on the album, and were actually featured. In, uh, sorry, featured in the photos of the band in the booklet and whatnot. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that, and why weren't you actually playing on the album? And of course, what was it like just co-writing that particular song? Um, I mean, it was a transitional period. Like I was joining the band. Derek had done the previous record, uh, all of the guitars himself, and. Yeah, I, I wrote that song, but he, you know, he was in the studio and we were all in the studio together, but we had all left and then Derek finished the record um, on his own. And I mean, it was a pretty, it was a pretty wild time for Derek. He was partying a lot. Like even when I was there, like there were times where I'd push my dresser against the door. Like I was like, I need to sleep. I can't 
stay up with you guys tonight. So I think, you know, he needed to focus. I think he needed to focus on that and do all those guitars just to distract him from the lifestyle that he was living at the time. So, I mean, I would have loved to play it. And I play on the records now, but it's, I think it's just a different thing where he's, it's easier for him to get us to play our parts and stuff. And, you know, it's, it, we don't have to go into the studio. We record them at home and send them in to Derek and then he, he assembles the record. Um, but yeah, that was a, trans, a transitional time. And it was, a, I was still relatively new. But um, it was, yeah, it was an honor. Like, um, I, according to Cone, I was the first person that had, uh, aside from Derek, uh, given a song, like, had a song on a record. Um, I, you know, Derek gave me a little guidance on what he wanted uh, uh, concept wise. And I had a few ideas that I threw together and, and sent it to him. And uh, he loved it. And then when I heard, like, I mean, it even improved on it. Like the vocals, melodies were better. It just, it, it came together super well. So I don't know. It was an awesome experience. Uh, and, you know, a further step into being part of the band by um, contributing to that song and collaborating with Derek on it. And also as well, on June 11th of 2019, Sum 41 actually released their most recent album uh, titled Order and Decline. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about this most recently released Sum 41 project. And of course, what was like? What was the recording process like? Because I have to admit, I I'm a huge fan of Sum 41. I absolutely love this record, but the sound is a little bit different than from previous records. Yeah, I think, I mean, generally... Like over the past few years, the records, the sound has gotten harder, uh, more heavy metal. I think that, I don't, I mean, he's got Dave, we've got Dave back and me, we can do like dual guitar solos and we can do some, all of, all of this crazy metal stuff. And I think it's, I mean, we all love the pop punk, Sum 41, but I think it's, we have the ability to do that as well. And it's, I, you know, it was such a depart. I think that, uh, you know, all of the records have kind of been back and forth. And I, I think that after um, uh, Underclass Hero, Derek just, he wanted to make heavy records. And so it's, it's just kind of gotten heavier and heavier. As far as the recording process, it's we do get together and we work out the songs together and, and, and do some pre-pro or some sort of rehearsal. And then uh, and then Derek works on those songs and then sends us the, the files and we record them. We've, we've kind of done it remotely like that for the past two, for the past three records. Um, it's just easier for everyone. We, we don't really need to get together. We've already figured it out. And, and once we hear the final arrangement or whatever, we know exactly what to do with it. And I got to say, my favorite song off that record is Never There, man. Such an amazing song. And, you know, I, I know I can actually relate to the lyrics growing up with No Dad. It's, it's such a powerful, strong, and yet a little bit of a sad record. But it definitely resonates with a lot of people. Right, yeah. I I mean, I love that song. Uh, we played it. She was one of my favorites to play live on that tour. We haven't. I mean, we're playing a shorter set with that with the Offspring right now, so we're not playing it. But I do love that song as well. And yeah, I love when when Derek's songs are really personal like that. Like he has that situation with his father not knowing his father. So it's the song holds when he writes a song like that, like that one or dear father, they hold a lot of weight because it's a, a real thing that he's talking about. Real pain he's singing about. And it's, it's awesome. And also before we move off the topic of order and decline, I knew, I know that you guys also did a promo uh, with legendary actor, Will Sasso. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about the behind the scenes of that particular commercial. And of course, what was it like just working with Will altogether, because I remember 
watching that, and if you briefly kind of watch the side of Derek's face, it's almost like he couldn't keep a straight face during that during that uh, filming process. The hardest thing is is keeping like we were laughing in every scene. With the, it it probably took about five takes just to for us to not laugh and I, I think we were like they just had to kind of work around us kind of losing it I, they had uh before i played with some 41 they had will sasso um do the intro for the still waiting video and so that was that was the thing was just to revisit that like 10 15 years later or whatever it was um and yeah it was great it was so much fun like the most fun video for for a while. I don't know. A lot of them are fun, but that one was fantastic. And also, the last Sum 41 question I actually have is that on March 23rd of 2023, Sum 41 announced that their eighth studio album titled Heaven and Hell, which is set to actually be a double album, uh, was announced. I was wondering, from what you are allowed to speak about, because obviously this is an unreleased project, I was wondering if you can actually uh, give us an update on how the recording of Recording or production is actually coming along. And of course, when can the world actually hear maybe the album or at least a single? Uh, the record is done. We, I mean, we finished it a while ago and then Derek mixed it. Um, and they're just finalizing like release details and stuff, but there should be news about that very soon. As far as recording it, we did it the same way. You know, we got together, played some stuff and rehearsed them a little bit and then recorded them at our respective home studios. Um, and yeah, it's awesome. It's also, it's got, Derek was conscious to bring back more of the uh, pop punk because we've been doing uh, anniversary tours for um, Does This Look Infective and All Killer No Filler. And it's so fun to play those songs that I think that that inspired him to, to write stuff that's more pop punk. So there's going to be a metal side, the hell side. And then the heaven side will be the, the pop punk. And I actually am really glad that, you know, you guys are giving us the best of both worlds. Because I do know, obviously, the news that you guys are, like, Sum 41 is, is disbanding after a big world tour in the album. So I'm really glad that you gave the metal fans and the pop punk fans just a little bit more Sum 41 all around. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, <clears throat> we love doing it all. So it, it's, it's a great uh, send off to do uh, both style, like cover the the styles that the band has done over the years in, in, in a really cool way. And also, aside from Sum 41, Gob is also currently on tour as well, uh, alongside Billy Talent. And but of course, before this tour was actually announced, you guys completely revamped your website, released some amazing vinyl that's available for pre-order right now. I was wondering if you can actually tell us uh, not only about this tour, but of course, what is actually next for Gub as a band themselves? Do you guys actually have any plans for another uh, full-length album? It, it, I think so, yeah. I, I mean, I have a bunch of songs that I've been working on, um, but all of, you know, all of this stuff, revamping the website, I, I noticed how much of a mess all of our stuff was online, so I spent a lot of time trying to clean up streaming services and connect everything, and get a website together. That's like where everything is central because a lot of people couldn't find God music or God videos or anything. And now it's a lot better. Um, and we've been, we've been working on the vinyl releases with Dine alone uh, for a while. Like they were, we've been working on them since last year. Um, and they came like, it's, it's been awesome getting it together. They really like, want to put they've come put out a package that is going to make everyone stoked like all the records that never came out on vinyl are coming out on vinyl the first ep we've got the original 1994 ep on one side and then we re-recorded it in 2014 uh live in the studio with the current lineup that's the first one then too late no friends how far shall it takes you world according to and foot and mouth disease None of them have ever been out on vinyl. So it's like a, an amazing package that uh, people can pick up. We're super stoked on it. Really cool vinyl designs too. They, everything looks awesome. And I'm actually super excited as well for your Kingston, Ontario show because me and my wife just secured tickets a few weeks back 
for uh, just for the pit. So I'm hoping to get there early and get front row for my very first gob show. I tried to get tickets when you guys were at the mansion. I think it was five or six years ago. And tickets went so damn fast that, like, by the time I got paid from work, it was, like, sold out. And I was like, God damn it. <laughs> Your first gob show. Wow. I think I th- yeah. think we played the mansion last year, didn't we? I, it, 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 it might have been. I remember. I remember you guys played it in 2016. Is when I when I was actually going to go, but tickets were tickets were gone like that. But I do know the mansion is such a small venue as well, so I wouldn't have I wouldn't expect any less for the tickets to go in a blink of an eye. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a fun place to play for sure. But yeah, all those shows are going to be fantastic. Billy Talent was doing a couple casinos with them in Alberta, and then a bunch of arenas with them in Ontario and BC and. All over the place, and also music for cancer. We're playing that festival in uh, in Montreal in September. We're playing a couple uh, Deluge festival in uh, uh, I forget which town, but in Quebec as well. Um, those are going to be awesome, and we're excited to play those shows and have the vinyl there for people to finally get those records on vinyl. And also as well, I, well, I have to ask, what is next for yourself, uh, Tom Thacker? Like, is there anything we happen to miss during this evening's interview? Anything else you still want to talk about, touch on, or promote? We still got you here live on the radio station Airwaves this evening. This evening. Um, it's hard to say at this point, but definitely, you know, more. Some 41, we've got a new record. We've got the, the world tour coming up, and that's super exciting. That'll keep me very busy for the next couple of years. And then Goth, you know, we'll be working on new music and it'll, it'll be out in some form. And, and we'll be putting out some old stuff. It's like some, try to get some of those old demos or alternate versions out and stuff like the uh, Green Beans and Almonds. Um, but aside from that, we're, we're just trying to get everything out, like get all the old gob out for, for everyone and, um, anyone can go now to www.gobband.com and everything is connected so you can find anything you want to know about Gob. And uh, yeah, Gob Band everywhere, at Gob Band. Or you can find me at Dummy Adu, D-U-M-M-Y-A-D-O um, on Instagram. And I just got to say, first and foremost, Tom, thank you so much for giving not only myself, but the radio station airways is a bit of your time. It was such an honor just to speak with you for these past uh, 37 minutes. I've been a huge Gob fan for so many years, man. So just being able to converse with an individual that made music that really positively impacted my life, man, is such an honor. So thank you so much. Definitely safe travels out there on the tour with Sum 41, Simple Plan, and Offspring. Y'all can get your tickets now. It isn't too late for some shows. And, of course, I will see you coming up next month as well in Kingston, Ontario at the Leon Center. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on the show, too. It was awesome chatting. Hey, you, you are most certainly welcome, Tom. Definitely have yourselves a phenomenal night. And hopefully down the line we can make this happen again sometime soon. But for now, definitely enjoy your night and safe travels as well. Awesome. You too.